You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. Just generally right now, you, you, you doing okay now? Everything on, everything all right? Strangely, uh, yes. You know, like... Um, because of the way India is so overpopulated and under-infrastructured and so forth, it usually takes the brunt of all of these uh, pandemics in one way or another, but we've been incredibly lucky with this one. So fingers crossed at the moment, you know, it's possible that they can undo, if, if for example, if they uh, open the trains too early, they could undo a lot of the good work that's been done. So fingers crossed people will be smart about letting it uh, go for another few months yeah yeah well that's the, well that's certainly good to hear and it was it, and, and you mentioned too about the um, uh i knew just in general about that dynamic that can impact india as a country and of course you live there how long you live there now uh michael just, uh, just six months shy of 10 years six months shy of 10 years and you are in uh mumbai specifically I have one apartment in Pune, uh, Maharashtra, and one in Mumbai. They're about two and a half hours away from each other. So I spend the weekends in Bombay where I have two businesses, and then I teach on the weekdays in, in Pune. And so everybody, I should mention that uh, this is Ken Vellante with Something Rather Than Nothing podcast. We are talking with uh, Michael Burns, who... Um, uh, is 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 a friend of mine and somebody I studied uh, with at the University of Massachusetts and a labor studies activist uh, a program. Um, a, a great man and great artist. And uh, part of this is catching up uh, with 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 Michael, who's done um, uh, some documentary film. He did one on EMDR uh, therapy. Um, and he has, uh, he has a lot of, um, writing. He's been, uh, on Ted talk. You see videos of him that way. Um, and also well-known made a name for himself in a very, um, very popular, um, uh, tall tales, right? Michael, can you tell us a bit about, um, just a bit about, uh, tall tales and just yeah. how you got started in India, putting that together and, and talking about storytelling? Yeah, sure. I'll try to uh, I'll try to sum it up in a few minutes. Um, well, you know, about six years ago now, uh, I was just trying to find some something to do with my time. You know, I came to India with my ex who was doing work here. So wh when that happens to you, the, the the other partner is kind of trying to find things to do with their time. And and I was starting to get into a few uh, ideas with writing. But I, I said to myself, you know, I've always been a big fan of the moth. You know, what if I did one night of storytelling um, here in, in Bombay? And we uh, I put together one night and um, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, people told true stories, you know, um, true personal stories. And then we said, hey, that was so much fun. Let's do another one. And uh, six years later, the next show will be our 77th show. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, we we get about uh, 20 stories per month for people that want to tell stories at our live show. And we only select four or five of them. So what happened was those other 15 were saying, OK, what's wrong with my story? How can I get some advice? And you probably know this from any any work that you've done, Ken, giving people concrete advice about how they can improve their work is something really time consuming. So, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what I uh, so about five years ago, I said, hey, I have an idea. Why don't I put together a little workshop where I can talk about some of the ins and outs of of quality writing and quality storytelling, so that the people who got a turned away for one reason or another can improve their stories. And that was, again, just a one-off thing. But my next workshop will be somewhere around my 250th workshop. And now I'm doing uh, work in different countries. And this small little thing has now grown into the most popular creative writing workshop in South Asia. So uh, it's ballooned to this giant thing. And I've learned so much along the way. So it's all tales we do these live Live shows, we do the public workshops, and we also do private consultations and trainings for companies and organizations. That's uh, it's it's really exciting to hear, and and it's very um, 
uh, I, I can just hear in your voice, you know, the, the <laughs> excitement, the excitement around it. And I, and I, you know, I, and I've listened to, to, to some of your stuff and some of the things you've had to say about it. And, um, yeah, there is a very compelling, uh, uh, component, um, about, about how you talk about the process, but also just, you know, the bravery that we have to try to find as humans to, you know, go up there and, you know, there's so many questions that buzz in our head, but just to kind of tell the story, tell a story, tell, you know, what yeah. happened and, uh, well, and, you know, like, and try to it, get that down. Yeah. You hit right on it with this idea of bravery and courage, you know, um, uh, one of the, I, I shouldn't even say one of the, the supreme problem right now, uh, in the world of storytelling is the overuse of the word story, you know, uh, Everything is a story, you know. Instagram says your 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 breakfast is a story, you know. It's like uh, it's almost to the point where any pile of words on a piece of paper is a story. <laughs> right. And the problem with that, you no, know, like like that that's a very nice sounding thing. And I hate to kind of pick on something that has a nice ring to it, but the problem with that is if you want to be better at storytelling, and yet everything is a story, you will never be able to fine tune those details because you've taken this very all encompassing approach. And actually, you know, a poem doesn't want to be a story. Sometimes a photo just is a photo, right? <laughs> Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> Sometimes a story is a story. And I think that uh, one of the thing, one of the reasons my workshop has resonated with people is I tell them like, let's not take this kumbaya version of what a story is. Let's talk about what a story is like we're building a bridge. Uh, and it's uh, a bridge is not the same thing as a sphere. A bridge is not the same thing as a car. Let's build the bridge together. And once you learn that, you're free to build any bridge, any size, any color, any shape, any function that you possibly want to. And I think people like that. They actually like uh, zooming in on the art of, of what a story really is and what a story isn't. So in my workshop, I spend a lot of time talking about what a story isn't. And believe it or not, people like that. Oh yeah, well, and I and I can I can definitely see a, you know, it's like a, a, in guiding that. Um, well, let let's let's um, one question I want to ask you, and you know, um, you know, kind of zooming back a little bit is, sure. and and I ask a lot of the creators um, that come onto the show, um, but you know, uh, did did you always, uh, you know, were you always a storyteller? Did you learn it? I mean, what were you like as a young, you know, as as a young Michael, a uh, younger child? And, uh, you know, as far as you know, areas around creativity or what interests you, stories, anything like that? You know, I had a strange upbringing in terms of where I ended up. Um, and... Uh, but, you know, like you don't have another life that you live simultaneously side by side to compare it to, you know, so it's kind of strange. Like I would never have it any other way, but I certainly see things that could have been uh, different. But uh, one of the reasons I love the kind of strange path that I took is that I, I, I was never encouraged to read when I when I was young. I don't even really remember finishing a book until I, I might have been 13 or 14 or something like that. I was raised on TV like a lot of American suburban kids. And um, I was always good at school, but it was just pure luck, you know, no studying, that type of thing. Um, bored with high school, uh, but very good grades, you know, because I was, I guess I was just bright enough to be able to do the subjects that were being taught uh, competently. But the reason why I appreciated that is because when I got into university, when I started in college, I felt like I was born. You know, I always joke with friends that when, when you turn 18, you should take on a new name. You know, you should get a new name because in some ways you have a new identity as, as an adult. And that fits me perfectly because as soon as I entered university, it was a new person that was born. Somebody who was curious about the world, somebody who suddenly found themselves loving reading and just soaking in every experience around me. So university became this hypersensitive time for me, whereas maybe for another, uh, another young person, university might have been just an extension of their high school experience. And so for me, I found a home in academics and went on for a master's as, as you and I uh, studied together, and then a PhD uh, later on. And uh, um, it was a very late 
a homecoming in the sense of an academic home, but I'm, I'm glad I found it. And, and I found it with more passion. There's, there's something called the enthusiasm of the late learner, somebody who comes to a field late, later uh, in life. And, and I found that, you know. Yeah, and I, 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 I definitely share uh, some of your experience and the energy around the impact of the university or whether it's a university or new ideas or as you get to adulthood and just being like, you know, intensely curious, you know, about things and what about this? And, and I remember, <laughs> you know, with you uh, just a lot, you know, like history and, and, and uh, you know, other type of uh you know, interest and in, in ways you developed. And, um, you know, I definitely identify with a lot of that. Uh, so now if we look at, if we look at, um, you know, I've alluded to, you know, some of the things that, you know, that you've done to, to, to start the podcast, you know, your current, um, you know, teaching the role of a teacher, um, uh, you know, storytelling uh, yourself. I know you've done, you know, uh, you know, uh, comedy and you've done a documentary film on EMDR. You have an interest in psychology And this podcast is about creators. So what is for you? What what parts of art or creativity uh, attract you? Um, is that constantly changing? Um, let's see. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to pinpoint because you know uh, I heard this thing you know you hear these things and they they just stick in your brain you know so I heard one time that you know somebody is supposed to have three three careers in their life you know and the first time you hear that you you're thinking well, well what what is that all about and the more you think about it the more you realize that a fulfilling life is actually full of mo of multiple interests multiple passions you know and um, there was I made I made five documentaries for American and international television, uh, and then I reached a point where I felt finished with that. Like not in a sense that I had con conquered the field or anything, but I was just ready ready to move on to another aspect of another dimension of my personality. And ironically, my PhD dissertation was on the the kind of psychological pitfalls of storytelling, the types of stories you can tell that lead to a worse society or that lead to a uh, destructive psyche. And strangely, I mean, incredibly, who would have thought that somebody who wrote that dissertation is now uh, giving uh, workshops on storytelling? But the reason I think that that's helpful is because I, I, I don't look at storytelling as this panacea. I look at it as something that's uh, useful for some things and not useful for other things. So um, my pursuit of art is just a reflection of the different uh, curiosities that I have. And uh, I don't know about you, Ken, but the more, the more I get older, the more I realize that curiosity is probably the most important thing that I want to nurture in myself and the most attractive thing that I find in other people too. I would I would completely agree with uh, with 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 what you just said, and I also you know think it it, it can it can challenge a, a lot of us when when those energies uh, come up, um, yeah. and you know it's not necessarily to stay on one of those tracks, or if you have an artistic mind bent, or you like to create, or you're you know a seeker in some sort of sense. Uh, you know, you're not going to get at the end point. You're kind of going to keep moving in, in <laughs> developing. Right. So, um, uh, given that, um, just chatting a little bit about art and, you know, kind of, um, ways of creativity, uh, for you, do you have a, a definition of art? Uh, you know, what, what is art? Uh, you know, I, uh, I like to, you know, some people don't like to define the undefinable, but I, I, I like it because uh, we also recognize that no answer is final. But I always thought that art is something that communicates to somebody. So if something, if, if there's a communicative experience going on here, then I think we have entered into, in, into art. I mean, when, uh, if you go, if you go to a modern art museum with somebody who hates modern art, you can see this in Technicolor because they'll say this is nothing like this is just a um, this is a, just a red canvas and it's all a, a kind of a capitalist game just to see how much money you can make off there's rich people doing uh, uh, bartering with uh, having too much money and so forth <laughs> um, 
But if but but if it says something to me, then it's art enough for me. So when something is entirely subjective like that, um, you just have to ask yourself whether there is a message for you or a reflection for you or a question for you. And if there is, it's art no matter how vehement, vehemently somebody else tells you it's it's garbage or a waste of time, you know? Yeah, and... Uh... It, and art has that component. I think when you know when you when you were talking about uh, storytelling in in your thesis, and I'm sure people you know start asking you additional questions about your thesis anytime <laughs> anytime <laughs> you're talking. Um, but uh, I just I just want to make sure I don't miss that. Um, it's I, I found it very evocative that you're, you're saying you know you're in the business of storytelling, and a lot of times yeah. when we talk about processes or activities. You know, they tend to be like, well, that's a good thing to do. When you said that there are some stories that 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 don't mm -hmm. quite work that way, that are that are harmful and, and things like that, yeah. it I, I I immediately jumped to politics, but I don't want to assume what you're saying with that. What 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 do you mean by that? Yeah, there's a political dimension, there's social dimension, and there, of course, it all it all dovetails into the individual psychological dimension. So I I was lucky enough to be the first student in the history of the UK to do an audiovisual dissertation. So I did a I did a uh, a, a three part documentary in six different countries, looking at young people's perceptions of democracy. Uh, at the same time as writing three hundred thousand words uh, for for my dissertation and. Um, one of the things that I was focusing on is the way that young people think about politics, the way they think about stories, the way they think about the, the stories that kind of animate their country's histories. And the, what I found so fascinating is that, um, that even though, again, we have this really uh, beautiful idea of that every moment is a story, that that storytelling has a very dark underside. And, and the, you mentioned uh, politically. So a story, uh, people often ask me, you know, a reporter will often ask me, what is a story? Can you give it in a brief sentence? And, and I don't like to do that because I think a story is building a bridge. So you have to talk about the whole process, but you come up with certain answers. And I think if I had to boil it down to something, a story is about, uh, is an attempt to solve a problem. So a story is an attempt to solve a problem. So politically, if you position your, propaganda, you could say, ideology, however you want to say it, as uh, Leader X will solve that problem for you. Let's, you. For example, North Korea, you know, Leader X will always be able to solve problem Y for you. You have a type of storytelling that has a very dark, nefarious underside to it. And it, it is solving a problem, but the answer they provide um, is shoved down your throat rather than proposed to you as a question. Uh, the, the 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 lighter side of that, I would I would say it's equally as dark, but it but it has a sound has a laugh track to it. Is the sitcom, you know, and the sitcom, we have a problem with and we have a resolution. But but the but the truth is that life's problems are far more complicated than than 22 minutes can solve. And it, and, it, and I think what it does is it prompts it primes the 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 brain to think of problems as things that are easy to to conquer. And to think of our life challenges as things that will be very, very temporary. But in fact, they might, uh, existential crises and other problems might last your, your whole life. So we live in a world where storytelling tells us that everything is a happy ending. Um, but very often the endings are absurd and tragic, as we're seeing right now. Yeah. And uh, I think I think when you're saying that right there, I... I... I didn't quite look at the kind of time frame of yeah of, of how how you tell the story and and that there is resolution and you know just thinking about the idea of you know what type of behaviors or what type of things we mimic or what our expectations are yeah, you know that's it. like yeah. I got this nagging problem and it's uh, it's still nagging me that doesn't seem <laughs> right you know right 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 so 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 you know so then people uh, when that happens people ask well what's wrong with me. You know, everybody, I look at all these smiling faces on sure. social media. I watch all these shows where everything is tied up at the end. Well, my life, the problems persist. What, what's wrong with me? And then depression and then so forth. But actually, that's the normal state of, of, of reality, you know? Yeah. Um, so have you ever stepped back? Uh, you help people create and you create yourself. Do you ever step back and say, why do I create or why am I creating this? 
Um, you know, there's if you step back far enough and you start to look at these big questions, which which kind of you're hinting at a little bit, which is, you know, why are we here and so forth? You know, there there are no good answers and there are no good. Um, there are no there's no solid ground to stand on, because as we know, you know, the, this whole thing might be a projection. This whole thing might be some kind of strange experiment, you know, but one thing that seems true for me. One thing, one thing that seems to resonate as real, as real as anything can be, is unnecessary suffering in the world. So I see my job, I see the job of all of us, is doing as much as we can to mitigate unnecessary suffering. And my work has been centered on social justice issues. My first film about the, my first major film about the Bush administration. I did a film also about the third party politics and getting more voices into politics. And then I did this one about EMDR and psychological catharsis. Um, but my other work also is about um, recognizing the parts of our own lives where we are suffering with unresolved trauma and facing that. You know, uh, uh, Plato's Apology, line 38a, you know, the, un the unexamined life is not worth living. You know, uh, I take that to heart and I believe that it's our job to look at where we're suffering ourselves. And once we free ourselves, from that, we can start to look at the suffering uh, of others. And to me, that's as real as anything. And that's as unifying of a, of a human mission as anything I can think of. Yeah, and uh, I think you gave me a tiny bit of license by mentioning uh, Plato. I, I do have to say, when in your, um, like I said, I was very in, intrigued about um, the, you know, the concept, the, the, the sitcom or that, that timing component. And I really did move back to think about uh, in thinking about Plato and Plato's philosophy and kind of like some of his comments about art in the Republic and about poetry. Um, but that it's kind of like this, um, this, 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 this repetition of almost like a false story or an, an artificial story that kind of stultifies the mind. And, you know, as as a writer and Plato being a brilliant philosopher, it was always kind of uh, it was always kind of troublesome because he had such you know uh, harsh words for poets <laughs> and others. Uh, in in his theory of art was like extremely um, vexing and 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 difficult. But there was seemed to be something there about, in my opinion, that kind of anticipated uh, a, a more modern media or the role that stories that aren't positioned well or aren't aimed in the right direction can get some negative results. Yeah. Uh, I just, I, I felt, uh, I felt uh, some of that in, uh, felt some of that in, in your answer. And I know you've done, you've, you've done a decent amount of Plato, if I recall correctly. I'm interested in everything, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, another thing I wanted to to, to capture is, um, and just to make sure I have it, um, as far as how you help uh, folks with with storytelling, is mm -hmm. this is this is this say you're helping me? Is this me going up on a stage and telling my story that way? Is it me, you know, getting it down and writing and telling the story that way, or people do both? Or how do you how do you specifically help help people do that? Yeah, so so the, the the live storytelling is just for it's just for fun. I mean, like even you know it's uh even when it's bad, it's still good. You know, I mean it's it's still fun to, to get up there and tell your story. So you know, like uh, sometimes it's hit or miss, but but it, but it's it's fun nevertheless. But most of my work right now is involved in writing coaching. So people will bring a manuscript to me or some idea about what they want to write for either fiction or nonfiction. And I will help them to shape it. Um, as I said to you before, the before we started recording, there is so much terrible advice about out there about writing, including uh, you're either born with it or not. You know, uh, or um, this idea that the that, that the whole idea is going to come to you in one shot or something like this. There's so many totally insane ideas that reject writing as a craft something that you can be improve at, something that you can be better at. And in a weird way, that's good for me because I think I'm providing a little bit of uh, hard, hard knocks, uh, um, you know, not, not, not a lot of hand holding in terms of how to build a bridge and how not to build a bridge. And people like that. And so they bring me their puzzle pieces 
and I help them to find out what a story is. We learn that together. And then once we learn that, to start to put the pieces of what they have together and recognize what's missing. And it's so much fun to see a novel like totally click for somebody once they recognize how the how the bridge is held up, you know, how the suspension actually works uh, with the other pieces and so forth. So it's a it's an incredible feeling to help somebody make their dreams come true. And so, yes, we do that on the on stage also. But the really fulfilling work is uh is with books, you know, I, you might know this, but 84% of the population wants to write a book someday. Uh, but that number I would, I would, I would argue is uh, uh, a lot higher than the people who are taking time to learn how to do that. And so my role is to help them to, uh, to fulfill that dream, you know? Yeah. I, I really love that. And what you had to say there, uh, I had a question I was thinking about, you know, um, you, you mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that you've been uh, in India for about um, a decade and, you know, you've, uh, you know, created there and, and, and worked there. And, uh, you, and you mentioned before that, that, you know, um, you've done uh, documentaries uh, stateside and done work in, in that capacity. Um, when you're going into creating something or trying to navigate two different countries, right? So particularly United States and in in India, uh, I mean, were you able to identify stark differences as far as what you were trying to do and what type of space there was for you to be creative in in each country? Um. Yes and no. You know, the, both of these countries are big enough that you can carve out, as you know, like there are some there are some incredible pockets of society in, in the U.S. Uh, where art is appreciated, where conversation and disagreement is celebrated and so forth. And then there's the, the vast majority of the place. The same thing is true, true here. You know, democracy is is very much under attack in India in terms of a free press. Um, in terms of quality elections and, and, and a whole bunch of other issues, including human rights, workers' rights, gender equality, we can go right down the list. In some aspects, we're still in the Stone Age here. In the U.S., we almost have the, this uh, kind of dystopian, postmodern version of it where people are willfully ignorant. Whereas here, you know, they're, they're, they're desperate to learn. In the U.S., the, the, the willful rejection of the hand in front of your face um, has terrified me so much, Ken, and I, and I'm so glad yeah. that there are people. There are so people. I'm so glad there are people like you who are willing to stick it out. But I just had to get out of there. I literally could couldn't take it anymore. Uh, and um, and I spent some time in Europe, and I loved that. And I spent some time in India, and and I I love it and hate it here too. But um, the U.S. is a place that's hard for me to spend a lot of time right now because of of what's happening to the culture. Yeah, understood. And I, you know, I mean, not to sit here and, you know, read everything into it, but you mentioned some aspects of the, the sensitivity to, you know, uh, what's going on. And I think there's always this frustrating component within the United States of this, you know, fervent anti-intellectualism. And yeah. um, it, it's just so vitriolic and if you combine that with a curious personality you know there's plen plenty of people <laughs> cur curious about a lot of different things and want to explore a lot of different things and you know it's it, if that's not valued you kind of feel well okay i feel like i'm going against the grain all the time <laughs> or i am going against the grain all yeah. the time you want to, I'll tell you a little funny anecdote that, I, that I, I think about all the time. I think about this way too much. Um, so one of my good friends I did my PhD with, Maria, uh, we were chatting a, a few years ago online, and, and she said, I just came back from a trip. And you, you, uh, she was kind of irritated about something. And I said, oh, did something happen? And she said, yeah, you know, I was sitting next to this guy on the plane, this old British guy. And you know how you sit next to people on the plane and they start talking? So I said, yeah, okay. And she said, and he asked me, uh, you know, I asked him what he did and he told me and he asked me what I did. And and Maria said, I told him I teach American culture at uh, Nottingham University in the UK. And then she wrote to me, she said, uh, can you believe can, can you believe what he asked me next? He asked me, is there such a thing as American culture? You know, and <laughs> and then she was she was like, I was so offended. I just turned my head and I didn't look at him for the rest of the plane ride. And and I said something I probably shouldn't have said, but I, I wrote to him. And I said, I'm not sure he's wrong. 
you know I, I I'm not sure what it is because because yeah. I know yeah. c- culture has something to do with history uh, if I had to pinpoint it I would say American culture is uh, buying junk with money you don't have I, or we can go back to conquering the wilderness and and, and bar- barbarism I, I don't know I really just don't know what it is so one of the reasons I see myself as, as a citizen of the world rather than a, a permanent resident of the US is I, I feel like unlike Europe and unlike some other civilizations, we, we're so new that there is no identity formed and, and, and the formation that's happening is too terrifying to watch up close. Well, let me, let me, uh, let me try. I mean, you've really prompted <laughs> my thinking. You've really prompted my thinking. I'm gonna try to sum up uh, the, the, the sum up the U S and the, some of the questions we ask too here, you know, I'm asking what is art, right? So, uh, I love, you know, I've started painting two, three years ago, love art, love painting, find out new things about myself, like what I create, all those type of things. And the headline today was, um, that the white house was going ahead with an approval to paint the entire wall between the United States and Mexico with black paint to the tune of a half billion dollars. Okay. And I put my phone down. I would have folded my paper down a few years ago and said, well, <laughs> that's it right there, isn't it? <laughs> a, half, a half billion, not only, you know, the wall's the wall, right? To make sure it's painted black for half a billion dollars and say right. we, are, we are no longer, we are unhinged from things I can understand. But uh, thank you for... Thank you for helping me with that a bit. <laughs> no, the willingness, uh, the willingness to sacrifice, because when we're talking about money, we're talking about sacrificing people's lives, of course. You know, so yes. like the willing, yep. the willingness to put people's lives in jeopardy for the sake of some death worshiping cult ideology is so profound in our country that uh, it's really it. The only way you can survive is by putting it out of your mind. Otherwise, you would just throw up constantly. You know. Well, I don't know. If, I don't know if the 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 this questioning is going to lead in, you know, or color the the particular question, which is the big one, Michael. I was wondering if you knew why there's something rather than nothing. <laughs> um, I I don't know whether there is something rather. Uh, than nothing, but I, I do think that um, that when somebody is healed, um, it is a moment that you share. So, and all the work that I do, whether it's trying to educate people through my films, my writing, or to, in the catharsis that I think I bring out through my storytelling work, um, it's all about healing wounds. So healing them as a country, as a policy or or as an individual and that moment if it is an illusion (laughs) if it is nothing if it has no uh, resonance beyond uh, its surface appearance then it is the greatest illusion ever ever created because those moments um, have ripple effects those moments can change your life that change they can change the lives of the people who who witness them so in storytelling, when I see that, um, uh, I'm touched by it in a way that makes me guess that there is something rather than nothing. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Michael. Now I, I know uh, we haven't seen each other in quite some time, <laughs> 20 years. Now I know I know I know I miss you. Uh, <laughs> I uh, just um, no, that's just that that's just lovely. And one of the things I was. Uh, forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, I, I remembered that we had, um, at the University of Massachusetts, we had collaborated together on the living wage study uh, sure. for Boston, Massachusetts. Right. And um, uh, we worked on that research project for a while. I remember we were annoying a lot of people with a lot of information requests. <laughs> and, but, you know, uh, like having, having, having beat up on the U.S. for a little while in the past few minutes, you know, let, let's just talk about the flip side for a second, because as we're seeing with the living wage 20 years ago, and as we're seeing with Bernie Sanders campaign and other things, is that ideas that were once thought to be absurd or impossible are now becoming self-evident. 
Um, Amen. Amen. And yeah. this and yeah. this is this is fantastic. This is the this is the great this is the great thing about America. So there are many many uh, many many uh, tragic things, but the best thing about the American uh, experiment is its willingness to relook at any idea and redo it if it if it needs redoing. You know, so so in 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 Europe, you have the tradition for tradition's sake type of thing. In, in, in the Far East, where I am, you have more of an autocratic way. So-and-so says to do it that way, we're going to do it that way. But in America, there's the spirit of entrepreneurship and experimentation that is incredibly attractive and important. And I, I love the fact that we were involved in something that made a difference eventually. And I think that Instead, because of the weird times that we're in now, instead of thinking about watching our trees come to fruition, we should be thinking about planting seeds that somebody else is going to nurture in the future. No, I really, I really, really appreciate that, brother. Um, I want to um to have uh, uh folks who are listening to podcasts to you know to be able to connect with you and the work that you do. Um. As, as well. So can you just kind of lay out um, just kind of ways to access, uh, you know, the work that you do or or point out uh, creations or things that you're working on, uh, whether it's on online or um, just just so yeah. folks can uh, link up with the work that you do? Yeah, of course. So my newest thing is I'm, I'm launching four new online writing classes. So I've, I've teach almost exclusively in the U.S., India, and, uh, and I just did a workshop in the Middle East. But um, but now I'm doing starting June 1st, uh, starting this this summer, I'll be doing some online writing classes worldwide. So that's Tall Tales, uh, T-A-L-L-T-A-L-E-S dot Podia dot com. So Podia is a great platform for uh, teaching online classes. So that's my newest venture. Um, Tall Tales dot I-N, T-A-L-L-T-A-L-E-S dot I-N is, is the website for my company. I also do this. I have this small company that does non-electronic educational toys for kids. You know, sadly, everybody's just staring at their phones all day here. So uh, I have a company called Kahani Cubes dot com, which means uh, story cubes in Hindi. And uh, it, we're kind of trying to bring back non-electronic uh, 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 ways to spend your time with friends and family. Um, and then I have my website, michaelpburns.com, uh, where you can find out more about my film work, uh, my political uh, uh, leanings, my interests, uh, as well as my new, uh, my new focus, which is the art of storytelling and, and the importance of telling stories that have never been told before. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Michael. I um, I'm definitely uh, going to um, uh, deliberately connect with you on 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 the writing workshop, and uh, I, I know it's just the the times the times right for me. And I know there's been a couple, you know, over the years, you and I have kind of sent a message here, there, back and forth, and the the same type of things, uh, you know, resonate um, for me. I think what you had to say about, you know, uh, the on the something rather than nothing question about, you know, the healing and the catharsis and the very, very deep, powerful human uh, transformation uh, that yeah. you can help folks with, you know, with the storytelling and with being able to write or, you know, attempt to understand our experience is uh, really some profound stuff. And um also wanted to thank you for taking the time um, to to join the podcast um, from from India. It's been a, a, a an absolute great pleasure um, to connect with you, Michael. And I, I very much look forward to um, uh, you know working with you in 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 in, in that writing process and uh, you know tap into some of the things that uh, seem uh, available within me. So I want to thank you for that. Thanks so much, Ken. Really nice talking to you. Always good to talk with an open-minded person. <laughs> Take care, brother, and thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye now. You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing.